Today is August 17, 2014. I have just returned from the Unitarian Church in Bloomington Normal where I gave a speech this morning. The talk was called Schmoozin' with Susan, a journey through Susan Palmer's life in art. And I thought before I got into my sweats and before I put the speech to bed and forgot completely about it, and since I have a video camera, I thought I would make a presentation on a video. Now, the speech that I gave this morning included a PowerPoint that had 51 samples of artwork. This, however, will not include that. So, art talk. Whenever I go to a museum and see <clears throat> a retroactive of one artist's work, I'm always interested to see how they've changed, developed, and experimented throughout their lives. Now, the first time I went to one of those, I was struck with the idea that the artist, who had lived many, many years ago, had taken the same art classes that I had been taking at that time. Well, I have given talks before about my work, but this time I thought I would do my own retrospective. So I had to think way back about things I hadn't thought about for a long time or that I'd forgotten about or that I never even thought about before. And I did come up with some new revelations. I'll try to share some of those with you. I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio. My father was an artist. He had his own business, Creative Commercial Art. He designed and created the artwork for the advertising for various companies. Now today, that would probably be done on a computer, but throughout his entire career, every mark he made was done by hand. My father had some related interests. When we got a new furnace, he converted the coal bin into a dark room, and there, he developed some of the most amazing black and white photographs of Cincinnati. Now, an historian from Cincinnati contacted me about a year ago about these photographs, looking for more information, and it was at that time it occurred to me that seeing and living with those mystical images when I was so young set the template for the way I would view the world and it's probably why I became an artist. My father had a large collection of symphonic records, and that was about the only kind of music I heard in my home the whole time I was growing up, with the exception when they took us to see the very first Broadway show that came to Cincinnati, Oklahoma. And then on Broadway filled our house, I learned all the songs. Now, some other things I enjoyed while I was work, uh, growing up were riding my bicycle, loved the freedom it gave me, and when my parents got draw drapes for the windows, I figured that I could use the windowsill as a stage, put my miniature dolls on it, and play theater. Well, as it turned out, those three things, exercising, making music, and making theater, became three strong constants throughout my entire life. They've always given me a sense of balance. I went to college at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. I did not claim a major, I made terrific grades, but I wasn't excited about anything. In fact, I was usually pretty bored. I did enjoy a geology course where they took us out on field trips and explained how the various landforms had been created. And I also enjoyed some of my phys ed electives. Horseback riding, I got to gallop off into the woods. And modern dance, where I got to move to my own choreography. I used to observe the theater majors. Oh, they were so involved. They looked like they were having such a wonderful time. Never dawned on me that I could take those courses. And I saw the art students carrying their work across campus. Oh, my father was an artist. I couldn't be an artist. Well, it comes about our junior year, my friend said, why don't we change to education majors and next year we can go to Cleveland, rent an apartment, and do our student teaching there. 
Well, that was too much fun. I got my first C's. And I did find out that once the school bell rang and I closed the door in my class, I felt like I was in prison. So I knew I could never do that. After I graduated, I wrote to the companies that advertised in Life magazine. I am a new college graduate. And I am wondering if you have a position for me in your company. I did hear from Procter & Gamble. They invited me for an interview and they offered me a job in their market research department. So for the next three to four years, I traveled constantly throughout the entire continental USA doing market studies. It was great. I learned how to travel. I learned how to drink and get up very early the next day and put in a full day's work. I did not carry with me a sketchbook or a camera, which would have been very detrimental to, to my work that I had to do. However, I did look, oh, I took in everything. Every shadow, every stairwell, every person. Oh, how the seediest things could be so beautiful. And I had no way to capture any of that, except in here. Well, I met and I married a young man who was working in Cincinnati. And I transferred to the buying department of Procter & Gamble. And then I decided I'm in one place. So I enrolled in classes at the Cincinnati Academy of Art. I was not bored. I could do the work. I belonged there. And then after that, I took every single art class that the University of Cincinnati offered. Then we moved to Hawaii. Now, the first week I was there, I went to Ala Moana Shopping Center, and I enrolled in a workshop for Chinese brush painting. Oh, I loved using that lovely brush and make the ink, you dip the bristles in it, and make these exquisite lines, a delicious color to the paper. This was a very disciplined form of art. After that, I learned how to work with batik, and I made a whole series of batik drawings. The subject was children's literature. And well, the Honolulu Library asked if I would display those. Ch Friends of my three-year-old, this show was called. That was my first one-man show. And it was so interesting to hang in that body of work together. It was like having a family, and this was a celebration of them. And when it was done, I took them down. I had a sense of completion and could go on to my next project. Well, I've done countless one-man shows since that time, always with that same satisfaction. Now, uh, during those quiet moments that I had to myself for the day, I worked on my oil paintings. And I took some of those oil paintings to the Honolulu Academy of Art to audition to be in their resident artist program. Every semester, they would bring in an artist from New York City or from Europe to teach that class. And these teachers prompted us to look into ourselves and produce our own original creative works. So I used that time to wean myself from oil painting, experimented with acrylics, made larger canvases. The topics were abstractions of forms of nature. After that, I took some classes in art at the University of Hawaii. The last class I took there was a very interesting one, the study of color. Well, I had said that this was a retrospective, and so far I've had no samples of my work to show you. Here I'd been working in the field of art for about 25 years by that time, and I had considered that everything I had done up to that time was just student work. Standing here today, though, I can tell you that an artist is always a student, and better should be. Well, then we moved in the middle of winter to here, Bloomington, Illinois. It was gray. Where was the color? 
Where was the shape? It was flat. Well, I managed to make a studio for myself in the basement of my new home. And there, for the next three to four years, I was there every morning, tuned to that wonderful classical music station that I discovered from Urbana, stretching my canvases and working on the study of color. I experimented with different color combinations, changing values, various shapes and what you could do with those shapes. Well, suddenly, I found myself as a full-time student at ICC, Illinois Community College in Peoria. I took all of their art courses. The teachers there encouraged me to show my work. First, they, uh, sh they showed all of my um, studies in color in the lobby of the theater building. And then when I was taking a watercolor class, <clears throat> they asked if I would have a show of my watercolors in the student gallery. And I agreed to that, and then I discovered, well, I don't have anything to show. So, for the rest of that winter, every minute that I was not in class, I would be sitting in my car someplace different in Bloomington every day, in the front seat, making watercolors, being visited occasionally by a policeman. What's going on in there? Well, the last show I had at ICC was with two other students. We showed faces. Now, I got an AA degree from that institution in graphic art. A couple months or before the, uh, we were through at the classes, they brought in these computers and said, this is the way this class is going to be taught from now on. Well, I was curious, so in the summer I went back and I took a class in how to create publications on the computer. I liked it so much that I bought my own computer scanner and printer. And for the next several years I devoted a lot of time to making publications for various organizations in Bloomington. I loved working on the computer. This was before the internet. Now I had lived in Illinois by this time, long enough for my aesthetic senses to start wakening up, and I decided it really wasn't so bad to live in a place that was flat and colorless. And then I started driving around looking for homes that had a certain mood about them. I treat my houses as though they are humans. They have human souls and problems and personalities. And I called this series of work my cruel doors. And then after that, I was driving down the highway and I discovered green elevators. Oh, they were gorgeous, magnificent structures. And I photographed, and I painted, and I showed all of those. Then I started my years of travel. Every year, at least one time a year, I would go on a tour to someplace out of the country. And what a thrill it is to see the scenery, the history, the art, the music, the food, the people. I carried with me my sketchbook and my little miniature watercolors, and at least one time a day I would make a sketch of something that I saw that interested me, and at the end of the trip I would gather all of those sketches together to make a journal of that trip. Now you would think that this would be enough stimulation for each trip, but no. Whenever I was on a trip I was at work. Every minute, every, every trip, I was on an angst-filled safari to capture images with my camera. Some of these photographs I used as subjects for my watercolor paintings. I converted my island in my kitchen into my watercolor studio, and for years I stood there reliving my trips by painting watercolors of them. Well, some of this audience may be familiar with my work and they're wondering, I thought all she did was make drawings. Now, when I was a student at ICC, there were several others who were mature and we would 
be meeting in the cafeteria every Friday afternoon to draw and to talk. Friday afternoon because that was the day that the pies went on sale at 1 o'clock. And then after I graduated, for years, every Friday we would meet either someplace in Peoria or usually a small town, Metamora, Shanoa, Secor. We'd spend the morning outside painting. And then at noon we would look for the local eatery and spend the rest of the day in there drawing the people and the settings. Now the people there didn't pay any attention to us and if they did they thought it was kind of nice what we were doing so I became relatively comfortable with uh, paint, drawing anybody anywhere. Started out using pencil but you know with pencil you can erase it, do something over. I needed something more unforgiving. Black permanent ink allowed me to do my drawing so fast that I was able to capture the gesture and the attitude of my subjects. Then I also went around to all kinds of music events. I love drawing the musicians while they're making the music. The music is part of the drawing. Once the music stops, the drawing stops. Now since musicians move so quickly and take so many positions, and since it's indefinite when this music's going to end, I had to be very select in which strokes I made and how many I could make in order to capture that activity. I took my sketchbook every place, to sports events, to the beauty parlor, wherever I was, and then when I came home, there was my favorite model waiting for me, my cat. Every position that she took was drawable. I had sketchbooks all over the house. And she was very accommodating. She would even sit and pose for me for up to 30 seconds. Well, I had been participating in art fairs for a while at that time. <clears throat> and I decided that I, I'm would take some of my drawings. They're easy to transport, and I was so delighted to find out how well liked they were and how many sold, which meant I could come home and do my favorite thing, make more drawings. Then people started asking me if I would make special pictures for them. Pictures of their cats, pictures of their dogs, pictures to celebrate special events like their kids are potty trained, there's an anniversary or an engagement or a gift for somebody, a, a gift for a playwright who made a play that you were in. Uh, people said they had children and grandchildren, they had all kinds of talents and interests, and they, they could dance, and they could be in all kinds of sports, so I did a lot of those. A realtor asked me if I could make drawings of the houses he sold so they could give those to his clients as gifts, and I did that for years. And then people would ask if I would make paintings of the home that they just moved into or out of. So I began devoting a lot of my time to doing commission work for people. Now, when I go out and do my own work, I don't go out looking for a subject. I go out and the subject finds me. And I become all wrapped up and excited about it and I try to capture that fleeting moment I don't look at my drawings right away. It might be a while until I open my sketchbook again. And when I do, I'm always surprised. How did I do that? And I tell myself, I don't think I could sit down and purposefully make a drawing that had such fearless, uh, fear, fearless energy and such spontaneity to it. Now, when I do my watercolors, I try to work with that same freedom. I, I know the rules for making watercolors, uh, but I just don't set out to make a pretty picture of a such and such. Whenever you put watercolor on the page, it creates its own magic, and I try to work with that magic, keep it alive, keep the painting alive and scintillating. Now, when I work for other people. I realize that they are aware of my style, that's why they ask me to do it, but there's still that trepidation. There are expectations I have to meet. And it is these scary challenges that my customers present to me, 
and the fact that they're always grateful that I've made something personal for them that keeps me interested in being involved in doing that work. My customers sort of labeled me artist, something that it was difficult for me to call myself. But I do realize I do spend most of my time doing that and thinking about it. And having received some nice awards over the years hasn't hurt at all. So when it came time that I had to make a site on the internet, I titled it Susan Palmer Artist dot com. Well, I said that I didn't have any earlier work to show you. <clears throat> However, I came across a box of my mother's memorabilia, and in it I found something that I had made that she kept. It was a picture uh, on a birthday card that I made for my father when I was a very young girl. I don't remember really making it, but when I looked at it, I was astonished. Here was a black ink drawing of my father doing his photography. Now, I don't think my mother kept it because it was something that I had made. I think she kept it because she loved my father. And by golly, there he was. I had captured him.